it was a terrible experience. I mean, I was there, left left basically completely alone with death threats, without a house because I had to move flats because wow. of the security threats, um, and without a job, and also facing potential legal threat, which would have never gone through, but from Tommy Robinson, who threatened defamation. Popular wisdom is that between 2016 and 2020, things kind of got a little bit strange. Whether it was Brexit or the rise of Donald Trump, we saw a cascade of political events which nobody expected and which got increasingly bizarre. They seemed to culminate in COVID. So you would think that in recent years, things have got a little bit more banal, simple, easier to explain, certainly less extreme. But in fact, the opposite seems to be the case. Ideas, individuals, organizations who were previously marginal, radical, out there, you probably wouldn't even mention them, have moved increasingly to the center stage of our social and political conversation. This is embodied by Elon Musk, the world's wealthiest person who himself engages with and enables often far-right rhetoric. So who better to discuss all of that than Julia Ebner? Julia's new book, Going Mainstream, looks at precisely these forces from the margins and extremes of politics as they go right to the middle of what we're talking about every day. Julia, welcome to Downstream. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, we will be talking today about this book, primarily, and some of the themes in it, going mainstream, how extremists are taking over. This is something of a follow-up to your previous book, which I loved. I read it in 2020, Going Dark. And as I'm sure you're aware, in Britain, because of Brexit, Corbyn, etc., politics was sort of very, you know, mono-focused. And what was great with Going Dark was you did all this amazing data collection from different parts of the world. And it was, it was one of the first books, I feel, like post-Corbyn, it was before covid this weird interregnum between Brexit and COVID, where I, I felt my mind was being opened up to some really interesting uh, data collection. So can you just sort of briefly um, explain the relationship between this book and your last one? Yeah, as you said, Going Dark was written in a time when COVID hadn't happened yet, the Ukraine war hadn't happened yet. In general, I would say that the extremist fringes that I looked at at Going Dark, where I went undercover with jihadists, um, far-right extremists, neo-Nazi groups, and conspiracy myth com communities were still really confined to the darkest corners of the internet. And I joined secret meetings that were happening in Airbnbs, and it all felt quite, still quite fringe and quite secretive in a way. Whereas now, what has essentially happened over the last three to four years with the series of crises that we've been facing is that a lot of these ideas have entered the mainstream. Mm. And that's also why this book is called Going Mainstream. And it looks at yeah how these ideas are entering the, what we used to call the political middle um, and are really much more widespread than they used to be. Mm. And just to be clear, in that first book, or the, your second book, but the first book of these two, Going Dark, you were doing data collection by actually going to things like far right, you know, punk concerts in Germany, if I can remember correctly, you were doing your own in-person data collection. Exactly. So I was I was adopting different identities to then join extremist groups online. So for example, I joined a range of neo-Nazi and identitarian movements online, and then also went to some of their, their events offline, including protests, but also uh, internal strategy meetings and so on. And what was that like for you personally? Was that, did that, was that quite sort of emotionally draining? It definitely was. It was quite challenging on, on a psychological level to also keep the necessary distance, um, to still be able to understand kind of what's driving them, because that was ultimately what I was interested in, was to see the human dimension of it, was to really speak to some of the people involved in these groups, to eventually also be able to say, what could we do to prevent people from joining um, extremist groups? But... But at the same time, I, of course, wanted to keep the necessary distance to provide analysis. And uh, I did feel like I could sometimes have some empathy with where they were coming from, mm. with their grievances or their, their fears. But of course, the ideologies were, uh, and some of the conspiracy myths were completely absurd and completely, well, and dangerous, of course. But was it upsetting for you? Sort of just to be around people saying such 
horrible things so uh, frequently. Def- definitely. And I think some of the most challenging situations were, for example, when someone made a racist joke or someone made a misogynist joke and you have to kind of go with it and mm. even laugh about it because otherwise your cover is going to be blown. So that's those were the moments when it was hard to stay in character. Uh, but also when I saw really young people, sometimes even minors join groups. Um, and that was also f- when I did the research for this book, that was also something I found really challenging was to not intervene whenever I witnessed how an 18 year old or even a 15 year old person would get sucked into those movements. Mm. And the book was published, makes a splash. You've got all the people on the back of this book saying how great your last one was. So, you know, um, Financial Times, Sunday Times Spectator saying how important it is, fascinating, riveting. And I guess there is to some extent, predictably, an onslaught from the kinds of communities people you covered who make your life almost like a living hell, don't they, briefly? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely had uh, quite a few hate campaigns targeted at me and also at at colleagues. And of course, it becomes something very personal because it very quickly gets quite scary uh, when I had death threats and sexual threats. Um, Usually that comes and goes in waves. So there are times, especially after publications, where these campaigns hit me particularly hard, but those are times when I might even become paranoid, turn around on the street to look over my shoulder so as to make sure that no one's following me. Mm. And it it does, yeah, it is on a psychological level, it was really challenging at times. Were you prepared for that? No, initially I was not prepared for that at all because when I started researching extremism and radicalization, it was in a time when these phenomena hadn't really hadn't really occurred yet on the wider scale that they do now. So phenomena like um, trolling campaigns or doxing when the personal address or personal details are being leaked on the internet, those were still very much in the early stages. And now, of course, it's a lot more widespread with journalists um, or politicians or activists facing that threat regularly. But no one told me when I first went into the countering violent extremism world that this is actually a potential side effect. Do you think there was a sort of safeguarding issue then perhaps? So like you, your book's been commissioned, it's been published. And I, I actually remember watching it myself and think, God, this is really nasty that you've been obviously subject to all of these things and you were, you were covering all these people and it clearly wasn't expected. And at the same time, I, I, you know, I don't think we give enough kudos to people who do that sort of stuff. I remember, for instance, I, I said before we did this interview on Twitter, I'm interviewing you, and somebody said, "No, I disagree with them." I mean, I heaven forbid you interview somebody you disagree with. And I was like, "Read, read her first book. The data collection is so impressive, so brave. You, you have to have some. I think everybody can read the first book and actually get something from one or two chapters and go hugely informative. But you know, anyway, I'm glad you you, you feel better now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But that's what I was hoping. I was hoping that people will would get some internal insights into how extremist movements work on the inside um, from from the books. And yeah, the idea is never to dehumanize or demonize anyone. Um, that's also why I take this very human centered approach. I always want to understand why people turn to extremist causes. How long did it take you personally to sort of feel better to get over it a little bit? That sort of initial stress. I think the biggest phase where I had the, the of stress was definitely when Tommy Robinson, um, the founder of the English Defense League, stormed my office or stormed my workplace to confront me in front of his back then 300,000 Twitter followers in a wow. live stream. What year was this? That was 2017. Wow. Was 2017. And he came to the office without warning after I'd written an article for, for The Guardian, an op-ed where I called him uh, or why, where I basically linked him to white supremacy. And that's quite, quite a reasonable thing to do, <laughs> not particularly outlandish. That's what I thought. Yeah. And also having analyzed his followership. And I mean, I think today there would be very little dispute about that. But he came to the office in almost, I think it was an effort to troll journalists or to intimidate journalists. Mm. And that after he live streamed that confrontation in the office, I received a whole wave of, of hate campaigns and, and death threats and yeah and sexual threats. I had to move house. And ultimately, it also led to me being, being fired by my first employer. Wow. And this employer was? This employer was uh, quite controversial now, the Quilliam Foundation. Yeah. And because I looked 
at or I studied far right extremism, especially I had a focus on kind of white nationalist movements and anti Muslim movements. I, uh, there was a bit of a conflict of interest. And I think it was, it was really difficult to reconcile that with what the organization usually stood for, which was more looking at the jihadist landscape. So why were you fired exactly? What was the reason? I mean, being harassed isn't a particularly good, from a labor law standpoint, you know, it's, you have to, you have to give something of a, yeah, I basically was asked by my by my boss to apologize to Tommy Robinson um, and to take back the article, to retract the article wow. in The Guardian, which I refused to do. And then um, I was given an ultimatum. And if I didn't do it by that time, I would be dismissed. And that's so what happened. This is Majid Nawaz. This was under Majid Nawaz. Yeah. yeah there so was a, he was, the, he was the, the, the director of the CEO. He was the, the executive leader of the organization. Yeah. So this is Mr. Free Speech leading an organization and the organization saying, unless you retract this particular article, which I mean, you would stand by, I think most reasonable people would say, uh, certainly it should be in the public realm. You shouldn't be quote unquote cancelled for it. And he was saying, you have to retract this or you won't have a job anymore. Yeah. It was not specifically him, but it was under his leadership. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Important to be factually correct <laughs> about these things. I mean, it's, that's, a, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the buck stops at the boss, doesn't it? It was, it was a really, it was a terrible experience. I mean, I was there left, left basically completely alone with death threats without a house because I had to move flats because wow. of the security threats um, and without a job then and without any financial means to, yeah, it, it was completely, and also facing potential legal threat, which would have never gone through, but from Tommy Robinson who threatened defamation. That's 2017. How long does it take you to sort of re recover from that? I actually went away for some time. I went abroad um, and that helped a lot, but it definitely took me at least a year to to fully understand how my, I myself, how it impacted me on a psychological level and to cope with it. I bet. And has it given you, has it given you tools to be able to endure that stuff a little bit better? Did you take any sort of learnings from it? I think so. I definitely protect my, uh, I think my, my personal life a lot better now. And in general, I'm I'm always trying to be extremely careful. I was back then as well, but I'm even now, now even more careful with um, how how I describe also individuals in the books or in any articles that I write. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that it caused me to, obviously it didn't silence me. It didn't cause me to, to censor myself. I think this would have been the ultimate goal. So I didn't want to give in to that. That's exactly what extremists are, are after with these kind of intimidation campaigns. But it did um, make me very aware in general that there is always a threat. And it also meant that I, I'm mentally more prepared for these kind of attacks. Did you ever think of just quitting? Because obviously it's a huge amount of stress you're under. Yeah, I had several situations uh, since I started looking at radicalization or studying extremist movements seven years ago. I definitely had a few moments where I thought, okay, I'm just going to leave this space and do something more. Also just something about that's more hopeful or more or less frustrating, less scary. <laughs> so what, so what, what, so why didn't you, I think the hope thing comes into it as well, right? Because obviously you're, I mean, it's easy to see how you could view your work as being a public benefit. I think that's inarguable. The first book, especially you're, you're exposing these movements to a wide range of people, but like you say, the downside is it's not hopeful or optimistic. And that must really, that has a big sort of psychological overhead. So how did you sell it to yourself? How did you say, no, Yulia, I have to do this. I have to push through. In the end, it was all about, yeah, about the value that um, it would add for prevention initiatives. I just, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to counter extremism and I didn't want to give in just because uh, some extremists stormed my office or just because I got intimidated online. I think it was, uh, it was quite, a clear decision in the end that I didn't want to be, I didn't also didn't want to give in to exactly what they were aiming for. What's your, what's your sort of political background or your religious background? Because that takes a real amount of sort of conviction. Yeah. And that doesn't come from nowhere. My, my, my experience is generally with people, it comes from a parent happens to be quite religious or they're very principled or they made sacrifices. So what's your story in that regard? I know you don't want to go into too much detail, but clearly there must be a personal explanation for that level of sort of yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't come from a very political or religious background. I mean, having said that, Austria is quite a Catholic country, but mm. I don't have a, a Catholic uh, background. I would say that it's more because of my own childhood experiences. I was uh, 
bullied in in high school and i think that already showed me how important it is that some people um actually stand up against those group dynamics against against those toxic group dynamics i always wanted to understand why people turn against individuals or against um an out group a demonized out group and of course bullying is different from extremism but there are some parallels and that personal experience really i think made me very um keen to to understand it better so i hadn't really thought about it but things have been moving at an extraordinarily quick pace. Because of course, Trump's elected in 2016, loads of crazy stuff happens, and you write your book in, in the late 2010s, I read it in 2020. But in a way, things have progressed far more quickly since then. So people think 2016 to 2020, you get Trump, you get Brexit, um, you have the Greek sovereign debt crisis coming to a culmination, <clears throat> you know, a crazy time. And actually the last several years have been far more crazy. So we've had a lot of these previously marginal movements, groups, ideas go center stage. We'll talk about what some of those are, but quickly, wh why do you think that has happened so quickly? Yeah, I've been I've been shocked just watching it sometimes in real time, um, how these movements could spread. I would say that it's been a combination of, of course, the crisis, the series of crises that we've been facing with COVID just being the starting point, but then also the Ukraine war. Um, which is yeah hugely divisive and also creates a lot of fear just like COVID did and now the economic crisis and living cost crisis which really does impact uh, millions of people's lives and which is a real a real uh, issue I think and has a very fundamental impact on people's vulnerability in general mm. because they uh, and rightly so there is there is then a, a rising distrust in institutions in politics but also, unfortunately, a rising distrust in science and in the media, the established media outlets, which has led to these frustrations and grievances being channeled towards something, some, something that sits on the outside of of the established the, the 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 institutions that were considered as the establishment, and that can be a positive thing. But I think in in the case of of yeah these crises, it's unfortunately led to extremist movements being able to exploit that. So this is probably something that we'll probably disagree over. But a theme in the book is um, rising distrust in the media, which is particularly bad in, in Britain, in the United States. And strangely enough, trust in the media goes up during COVID and then it you know, goes back down again. But it's interesting how when there is a focus on information, data, straight talking, objectivity, people trust it again. This, I think there's a lesson there, but we'll park that for a moment. I mean, do you not think people are right to distrust the media? So for instance, the Iraq war. New York Times front page, The Observer in this country, the way that the reasoning behind that war was explained. We can blame politicians in the political class, but ultimately you can vote them out of office. You can't vote you know, media owners, proprietors, editors out of office. And I, 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 feel like, I feel like the media as an industry is sleeping on the extent to which they themselves are responsible for declining trust in them. Am I being unfair? Mm, it is a good point, and I think it, it is an important one. And there are certainly double standards sometimes and in applied to reporting. And there is certainly a selection. There is a curation of content, essentially, which um, in some cases can lead to to these rising mistrust levels. Um, I, I do think some of that is a legitimate uh, level of or skept skepticism or a legitimate level of also crit criticism. But um, what we've seen now with the series of, of crises with COVID and so on, I think that has that has really led to such a deep distrust that, of course, labeling uh, entire media institutions that, that have long been seen as trusted news sources, labeling them as, as completely as fake news or as just producing stories for the sake of it, or because they're even um, said to be uh, run by the global, the so-called global elites, and there is a hidden agenda, I don't know, com combining it with some more uh, sophisticated conspiracy myths, I, I think that is going a step further. I do, I, and it's new. And that's new. You're that's right. definitely something, at least on that, uh, yeah, on that widespread level, societal level, that is something new. And of course, we can talk about legitimate grievances that are underlying this phenomenon, but I think the dynamic itself is quite concerning because if we look at at countries like Germany when 
um, the Nazis were on the rise. There was this word Lügenpresse, lying press, mm. that has now resurfaced for mm. the first time since then. This word is being used again and is being used in a very systematic way um, to completely delegitimize the wider media landscape. I think it's completely fair to criticize one media outlet or another one, mm. especially on specific occasions, like you mentioned the Iraq war, but to, in general, to basically label them as fake news institutions, I think that's going a little bit further. Mm. Mm. I think that's fair. I mean, I love to criticize the BBC, but I'll always defend Radio 4. <laughs> uh, I, I even say this when I've been interviewed by Radio 4 people, I say, I know you don't run adverts, so let me praise you on air. But I... I, I, I I think that's a reasonable, uh, a reasonable response. The, the stuff you're talking about in this book as well, about how extremists are, are taking over or going mainstream, there's, there's two reads on it, which is one would be, oh, this is completely over the top. This is hysterical. Um, you know, you're too online. And actually, if anything, I think you understate the problem mm. about how mainstream it is. Um, and this for me is something which I find really useful about not living in London. So I don't live in London. And, you know, I meet all, all panoply of people. And obviously I go around the country, like everybody loves to say in politics, and media, I go around the country, but you go around the country, you talk to people who aren't in London, aren't in politics or media circles, and things that would be considered completely insane and batshit are believed by large numbers, and large swathes of people, completely crazy things. Like, for example, that the people in Buckingham Palace are reptiles? Or? We're, not, we're not quite there yet. I mean, that one may be less so, but like pandemic, mm. right? There's, there's like COVID skepticism. Like I think I, I personally, and maybe we disagree on this, I think it's perfectly legitimate to be skeptical about a vaccine that you've never heard, heard of before, hasn't had necessarily the, the levels of testing and, you know, double blind testing, et cetera, et cetera, that other vaccines have previously. I always said, well, look, the upside is much bigger than the downside. We have to be quite reasonable about this. Yeah, but, but I understand hesitancy, right? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's not illogical. But, and many many people had that, and I think it's a perfectly you know logical, understandable thing to have. Then the level above that is like the pandemic stuff. Yeah, and and like I I genuinely think a really serious minority of people believe it, mm. like that it's you know COVID isn't real. Yeah, that definitely reflects what I found as well, and I completely agree with you that there is a spectrum, and I I also try to be very nuanced in the book about separating kind of the really the, the crazy conspiracy theorists from someone who just has a healthy amount of skepticism towards anything really i think mm -hmm. and uh, including the vaccines which for example in minority communities there was a real concern that the vaccines um were not maybe not uh tested enough on on their specific uh cultural uh, ethnic background for example the black community there wasn't there, there was a, a legitimate concern that there might be uh maybe a yeah maybe a shortcoming in that and yeah i i'm not sure that i have the full explanation of where this is coming from why now as you say significant minorities of right. the country um but big enough to actually make for a voting share uh believe in conspiracy myths and even in some of the more absurd ideas it's it's definitely something where I feel like the combination of crisis, this poly crisis that we've been facing and new technologies, mm. I don't think we've had that at any time in history before that there's this combination of a complete revolution in the new technologies at the same time as a global health crisis, economic crisis and security crisis, if you count the Ukraine mm. war. Um, so I think that is really, that is something quite unique and something unpredicted in terms of the challenge, the level of the challenge that we're facing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, we're on a level on that for sure. And I think there's, again, it's, there's two ways of reading it, isn't there? There's, there's, it's very alluring to think you live in unprecedented times. You know, from a narcissistic, narcissistic point of view, it's very nice, to, well, it's not nice, not gratifying at all, but it's that, that, that you can argue there's a psychological or a cognitive bias to want to live in a complex, unprecedented time. But then, like you say, you look at the, you look at the facts, end of Atlantic sort of domination with geopolitics, technology, global health crisis, rising inequality, technological change, global real-time communication, yada, yada, yada. And go, okay, maybe the Reformation, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, 17th century, 16th century Europe, maybe. Yeah. But certainly nothing recent. And it feels to me like large swathes of the political establishment don't really acknowledge that. They don't really acknowledge the scale of what you just said there so, so succinctly. I agree because it's hard to look at it from the present 
perspective and i think it's always easier in retrospect to then we'll see it in the history books how these times are will be described um my biggest fear is that we're now shifting towards a kind of digital middle ages where i already see us depart from a fact-based evidence-based conversation towards more myth-based um discourse and even policy making i think that is something where I'm I'm very concerned that that might actually be the starting point. But of course, it's if we look at history, there have been times where there were significant global challenges or, or pandemics or economic crises. But even then, they usually led to consequences. There was usually a large uh, there, there was usually a, a large rise in conspiracy myths and anti minority hatred, and they even in many cases led to radical societal and political change. So I think it's it's almost it would be yeah it it would be stupid to underestimate the consequences of this. So uh, there's an interesting inference from what you just said there because you interview we don't interview you meet with Mark Collett and people from Patri Patriot Alternative, which is a a far right organization, hugely unsavory people. But what's interesting when you said that is, in a way, you would agree with somebody like Mark Collett about the, their theory of change or the, the, the political opportunities that are emerging in the 21st century. So they have a very radical diagnosis of what's wrong with society. You would disagree with it. I would disagree with it. From that diagnosis, they have a very radical prescriptive sort of set of quote unquote solutions. Again, you would disagree with all of that, but what you agree with is, well, actually the status quo with regards to a whole bunch of things, inherited value systems, perhaps how we even maybe do empiricism, how we do science, that's kind of crumbling. And actually these are quite fertile conditions for somebody like a Mark Collet or a patri patriotic alternative and, and people on the far right. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that is true. I, I, I do believe that it is a fertile ground for them um, to, yeah, to mobilize. And we've seen that also their resonance with really young people, with minor, uh, minors even, and school age kids. There is something about this, especially the younger generations of having a lack of perspective, of losing hope. And I think that makes them also more susceptible to extremist ideas. And that's something that Marc Collette or other extremist recruiters can, uh, can leverage. And it's something that we see in the numbers, even just looking at radicalization numbers now, um, shows that there is a rising, that the, the numbers are particularly high among uh, younger audiences. I think for conspiracy myth movement, it's interesting because QAnon and the likes are actually more, uh, sometimes more targeted at the older generations where there is uh, almost uh, an average age of, I think, 40 or 50 plus. So there's an interesting discrepancy there. But I would say that Mark Collette and also from the conversations I had with him, I played this association game with him where I gave him a word and he had to immediately um, say out loud what he what came to his mind, which was quite interesting to get insights into how his mind works. Um, but there, he also it it was it was incredible how he managed to tie everything back to to this great replacement idea, but often then tying it to politically relevant issues and to issues that are probably on the minds of many people, to climate change, to um, COVID, to yeah. So what was this word association game? So what were the sorts of answers he was giving? He was, uh, well, I gave him words like, yeah, like COVID, which he would um, call a manufactured crisis um, by the global global elites. Then I also gave him words like, um, like climate change, which he would say is just, again, a manufactured problem that is supposed to guilt trip white people into having fewer children. So he would link it all back to white identity or in the but, end but to conspiracy myths. There's an ounce of truth to that though, in so much as younger younger people from sort of non-minority backgrounds in this country, many of them do give the answer that I don't want children because of climate change. That, that, so did you find that there was always a kernel of something there? Of course, that's also why it works so well, mm. because there's usually most of these campaigns work in a way that there is a grain of truth, at mm. least in it, or there's there's something there that they can build out to to a bigger narrative. Even QAnon were, even with the most ridiculous claims of QAnon, there is often a starting point that might contain some true facts in it. 
and and then it's it's of course it's it mutates into something a lot more dangerous because it it demonizes an outgroup or it dehumanizes an outgroup. So in in the UK, there's a there's a, a nice phrase you use in the book called Zuma nationalism, which is what you're sort of touching on there that younger people might find this this right wing radicalism very alluring because they haven't got much hope, but for reasons I think we we touch on very frequently here at Navarra Media, climate change. Stagnant, you know, wage growth, et cetera, et cetera. The demise of the high street. And what what we generally think on the left in Britain and America, and I know this is not a universal phenomenon, is that younger people are more progressive. Gen Z and millennials, millennials are becoming more left-wing over time. There was this great data in the FT recently about that in the UK. Um, that's not the case in places like Italy, for instance. But what seems to be the case is that in Anglo-America, so to a lesser extent as well, Australia, English-speaking countries, Young people are significantly more left-wing than older people, but also they're not getting more conservative as they get older, or if they do, not at the same rates as boomers did. Yeah. But what you're saying with Zuma nationalism kind of contradicts that. So what, what's the story here? Are Gen Z actually very radical and very left-wing? Is that a myth or are they up for grabs? Is it more elastic? I would say it's it's more polarized from also from what the research shows it goes into some of them are more liberal more open minded and you even see it in their attitudes to work and to to gender and to different on different issues of course climate change where they are a lot more progressive and also more activist or proactive in their political thinking and on the other hand there is there is this fraction of and and it is a, a significant fraction of the gen z and now also potentially of generation alpha the next generation alpha that is um hyper -conser conservative if not to say paleo conservative and also more prone to radical right wing right wing uh, ideologies so that's that's been quite interesting and it's been shown in some surveys and some research where they are on many levels they're thinking about family systems about um, social policies and so on is a lot more conservative and more traditional. But do you think that's, is that Zuma nationalism or is that potentially um, a reaction to what's really been a revolution in social values over the last, well, 65 years, but particularly with LGBT rights in the US, for instance, legalization of gay marriage, trans people have really gone to the forefront of the national conversation there. So on the one hand, you can say, Trans people have never had it more tough, which if you're looking at recorded hate crimes and so on, or the, the, the focus and the magnifying glass that's put on them in the national conversation or, you know, Donald Trump villainizing them, absolutely true. Yeah. But at the same time, they've, they've never been more prominent in culture in terms of protagonists starring them in TV series or people willing to work with them as faces of ad campaigns or just basic integration in their communities and, and lack of bigotry. So... Do you, do you, or do you think I'm being too optimistic there? Is that is there a sort of slight, because young people like to sort of revolt slightly against the status quo, so they might see, you know, pride branding everywhere and say, I'm not quite sure. Or do you think there's something a bit darker going on there? I think there is an element of that rebellion. Uh, usually there, it's true that the younger generation would go against the ideas of their parents' generation or of the generations above them that shape policies because it's more interesting to belong to a counterculture that goes against the status quo and that goes against the, the what's still considered kind of mainstream culture or policy. And um, I do think there is an element to that, but there is also something a little bit darker, I would say, going on, which is that, of course, many... Um, young people, I think, feel left behind by politics, either because of the, the pace of change that has happened, because they just don't feel like um, they, they would yeah, feel that uh, what they would then call woke policies and so on, that they're going too far and that things are changing too quickly, or because they feel like not enough is, is changing. That, and that is also, that is uh, legitimate to say that social inequality, economic inequality hasn't really been tackled enough by policymakers. So I think there are some very pressing issues that have been kind of neglected. And I guess that also leads to this very deep frustration with, with politics in general that is to some extent understandable, but that can be, that can be instrumentalized and exploited for, for darker causes. So so do you think we've got it wrong when we say, oh, it's generation left? Do you think we've got it wrong? Do you think actually, guys, you're missing out something here, which is a, a, a significant minority of young people really getting radicalized to the other side of politics? Absolutely. I think it's a huge, I think it's not nuanced enough to, to say generation left. 
think there is it's a lot more nuanced than that yeah and, wh- and where are these younger people where are they primarily accessing these different kind of political ideas what kinds of platforms social media are they using there's a whole alternative universe of platforms that has emerged kind of in opposition to the bigger uh, mainstream social media platforms to the big tech firms so there are youtube alternatives like odyssey and bitshoot which are the kind of the far right extremist alternatives to that of course, you also have had um, lots of social media platforms like Gab and Parler and Getter that were also founded with a similar purpose, which have been very much populated now by far right extremists um, and conspiracy theorists. And then there's also um, very much uh, now the, the Telegram and encrypted messaging apps are being used very widely as well. So I think it's a combination of this yeah, I would call it the old tech universe, um, alternative tech platforms where a lot of the the radicalization is happening there. And of course, you might find groups or individuals who are not completely radicalized on these platforms. So it's hard to generalize, but broadly speaking, those are the platforms where a lot of the radicalization is happening. And it goes back again to what I was saying at the start with going dark, because you talk about the role of alt tech. And at the time, that felt like a very marginal debate, right? Oh yeah, maybe in twenty years this might be a thing. Um, but actually, if you look at the, the case study of Andrew Tate, this is somebody who was deplatformed um, across mo- multiple social media outlets, and he he became more prominent. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Because he was going against um, against anything that would be considered politically correct. I think it's it's that unfortunately. It is a success recipe of many of these um, far right and also misogynist influences to completely, completely break all taboos and to uh, to go completely against um, what some people would call the woke culture. That's something that Andrew Tate did, and I think he hit a nerve there, unfortunately, especially with uh, feminism having, of course, caused some young, young men or in general men to think that this is actually going too far. And Andrew Tate really tapped into that and and did so in a very, unfortunately, quite a charismatic way. Yeah. And again, it's another one where some people watching this or listening to this will think, I'm, you know, I've heard of Andrew Tate, but he can't be that big a figure. And, um, you know, I, I can't remember the exact details, but I think the number of TikToks using the Andrew Tate hashtag were at 1.14 million. Yeah. Yeah. Millions of people. Yeah. And I, I probably, it's probably more, maybe I've probably got several, I'm missing several zeros, you know, as he likes to so frequently say, the most Googled man on the planet, probably for like a week, but regardless, more Googled than I remember, this is last summer, Donald Trump, Madonna, you know, um, you name it, um, Lady Gaga. I remember looking at Google Trends, you know, he's beating all of them for quite a while. And, and for, for parents, for teachers, they've never heard of this guy, but actually as a, a role model, as a sage, as a moral tutor, he's, he's quite central to like millions of young people's thinking, uh, which I, I find really, really, um, really remarkable. And, you, and so you, you said his charisma, where do you think his, his appeal comes from? Because he is clearly very, very appealing to a, a big section of young people. Yeah, I think it's by his use of pop culture references by his hu- partly humor that is politically incorrect, but where he's, he's, yeah, I think it's, it's breaking these taboos that unfortunately makes him so appealing to, especially to the younger generations that grew up with a lot of, of social, with, with a lot of socially acceptable norms that they also had to imitate. And now there's someone who completely breaks through all of them and who, yeah, I think almost frames himself as as the complete counterpart to to the status quo and also taps into something something a bit deeper on an identity level especially on kind of a masculinity crisis level um i think that is there the whole misogynist um the misogynist ideas that he spreads they are also it's very how would I say that? But it's, I think it's representative of, of a bigger trend that we've seen emerge over the last few years already, that boys and men sometimes feel that feminism has gone too far and that they're looking for someone who actually uh, puts their thoughts into words. And Andrew Tate did that without any, without limiting himself or without uh, self-censoring his discourse. He would just say whatever he, he thought 
But I guess with Andrew Tate, I, I find him a, an interesting phenomenon because he's responding to clearly a crisis of masculinity in the West. Clearly, I think a, 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 there's a there's big big problems for men in our society, particularly for young men. And I think sadly for years, progressives, the left, have either ignored that or they've they've mocked it. They've actually said, oh, men, stupid men, hate all men. And I, I, I think that's a very, very silly response. I think it's politically counterproductive because you're basically saying the far right have these people. And I, and I also think that, you know, as a species, what we are, humans have been around for, what, 300,000 years. But for tens of thousands of years, it was very useful to be physically strong. These were things that were useful. We are, we are animals. As animals, it was very useful to be physically strong, to be irrationally sort of brave, to be courageous. Um, but now we live in a society where, you know, high levels of automation, technological development, you know, in the early 21st century, that, that those just aren't prized attributes anymore. And the things that women have developed, and this might sound biologically essentialist, which I don't mean to be, but I, I think this is, this is broadly bro bro sort of borne out in the data, Women have just better attributes than men in many ways, the kind of society we now find ourselves in. And I, I think that creates problems. So the genesis of this is a very good thing. Gender equality, feminism, very good, thing, brilliant thing. Um, and I don't want to use the word downside because there is no downside, but it clearly has sort of political and social cultural consequences, which I think, that's, I think that might take centuries to work out, right? I, th I think it probably does. And I think it's also, I mean, I completely agree. I think it's that is actually a big point, but also that women are increasingly occupying the, the spheres of responsibility that used to be male dominated. And now there is there there hasn't really been a new role found for men or that responsibility that is also that should be part that should be divided uh, fairly in the household or with childcare that hasn't yet been something that is really valued and really uh, respected and appreciated if men take up a share a share of that to also go into the the, the traditionally female dominated mm. spaces that it, it's been a one way in a sense if we also when we look at the data it's still been rather a one-way road towards women going into the male dominated spheres but not necessarily mm. the other way around mm. i mean i've got so many i've got so many i've got male friends but also my wife has female friends and what's just interesting is that it is just now so common for women of our age cohort i think we're probably similar sort of millennials uh for women to be earning more than their male partners i mean that's good that's great um fantastic but you know, again, like I wonder the sort of disruptive nature of it. And I see, I see so many men. They hit thirty or just after thirty, they lose the plot, and I don't know why. You know, their mental health sort of collapses. I mean, I have a hypothesis that, you know, um, that generally, again, as a species, you sort of have kids arrive and they take your mind off things, and you know, you don't worry about yourself so much. But I, I, I do feel like there is a massive integration between what we call, you know, mental health crisis for men and their female partners. So what happens is the male partner goes off the rails. Society talks about, oh man, you know, depression, suicide, et cetera. The people picking up the pieces of the female, you know, the, 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 the woman, the, the, the male's partner, and this sort of integrated connection between, you know, the huge downsides for men, which we're talking about, they often have huge downsides for the relationship. The relationship might not even work out. Um, and, and there's a big problem for women. And often I, I see people, you know, uh, saying oh, I'm struggling with men in a relationship or whatever. I look at most men in their twenties now, and I think I really feel for them. Right between the housing crisis, with rent um, going through the roof, constant debt, not having money, like you can't enjoy your life, and all the things we were taught to prize and value as men, you can't do. And I can understand why after like ten, fifteen years, that really knocks the stuffing out of you and the pride out of you. Um, and it's a it's a it's a really sad thing. And the problem is then there's and this is a big social issue we don't talk about. There's this huge vacuum. Andrew Tate can gobble up so much of it, and I feel like we haven't really got many answers of our own. So is there do liberals need an Andrew Tate, Julia? Is that the answer? I'm not sure that's the answer because I just disagree also with how Andrew Tate does uh, how how he galvanizes his followers and how because he is very manipulative in a sense so i'm not sure we need the same type of manipulative character on the left or on the left liberal leaning side of the spectrum but it would it would perhaps help to have someone charismatic who can 
yeah, who can mobilize people for progressive causes and for liberal uh, values. I think that's something that we are missing a little bit. Let's talk about um, Donald Trump. So let's say he becomes president again in 2024. What do you think happens? What does that look like? I think, frankly, that would be terrifying. I, I honestly think that could really cause, I mean, not just the US to really, it's already so divided, but I think there are some, some scholars that even say that the US is at the brink of a civil war, and that might be a bit too that might be maybe too stark as a formulation, but I do think that it would it would cause incredible internal um, yeah conflict. And of course, there is also a clear there is there has already been the sense that attacks against democratic institutions are becoming more frequent against democratic processes. I think the whole run up to the next election in the US will show whether this is now becoming the new normal or whether this was just the one off. But my fear is that with Trump feeding into those election fraud narratives, feeding into people who hold profoundly anti-democratic ideas and anti-minority ideas, that all of these types of attacks, both against democratic institutions, but also against minority communities are going to be even more frequent. Um, and they could also, of course, inspire similar activities here in the UK or in, in Europe, which we've seen with the, the US Capitol riot where we've seen very similar, what I would call copycat incidents in other countries. Of course, there was a few months before the capital riots in the US, there was the attempted storming of the Reichstag in Germany. And a few months after it, there was the, um, th there were violent escalations in front of the New Zealand parliament, uh, with very similar slogans being featured on the banners with very similar kind of anti-democratic, uh, symbols and, and, yeah, and ideas being voiced there. And it, then there was also the attack on the Brazilian Congress. I think though these are really trends that are quite worrisome, and especially looking at the next US election. I think there's something to it. You know, there's, um, there's, a, there's a TikTok landlord in this country called Samuel Leeds. Have you heard of Samuel Leeds? Yeah, I've heard of him, but yeah, not. He's <laughs> just a, he's a clownish character. He's quite funny. So, you know, a year ago, he was saying, you can do this, you can do this, make money. He sounded like an alchemist making money. Now interest rates have gone up. He's saying, you know, Bank of England. And I was watching a YouTube video of his. This is like a guy who's like, a, you know, 250,000 followers on TikTok. He's never, spoke, he's never spoken about politics. And all of a sudden, he's talking about the World Economic Forum and how it's a plot to raise interest rates. And you think there's two and a half million buy to let landlords in this country. They've got big social capital. They've got lots of capital capital. And like you say... The, the, we're already seeing like people going towards parliaments, embracing more radical politics. And I think with interest rates go to seven, eight percent, does somebody like Samuel Leeds become, you know, uh, one of these figures that you're talking about? And the fact it's already happened when the economics aren't that bad. Yeah. Like if that, you know, you, you, there is a there is a way where you, you look at Europe in the 2020s. Let's say by the 2026, 2027, if this war continues and so on, like very permanently high inflation, deindustrialization. And I can just, it's a very, very scary thing. But with the States, sorry, just go back to the United States and with Trump, the prospect of civil war, that's something you said, but then you said maybe that's going too far. I mean, I've, I've spoken to lots of serious people in the States who think it's yeah. really possible. Yeah, Barbara Walters is one of the, the scholars who is a leading civil war scholar, and she wrote the book, How Civil War Starts. And she said she's found all the patterns that um, that you could see in in countries that then had a civil war kind of in the in the uh, run-up period to that, you could see the, some of those signs and some of those patterns in the US. And that's definitely really concerning. The other big, I think, big threat for the US if Trump gets back in power is, of course, the reversal of human rights, which in some, to some degrees, we are already seeing that with abortion rights being cut, with, um, yeah, with attacks on the LGBTQ community. I think that is something where we might see actually a reversal of the human rights that um, have required decades of fighting and that could potentially also swap over to to Europe and to to inspire the UK or, or the European landscape in the past. Very often the US have led the way. And what do you think of Elon Musk? You mentioned him in the book. I mean, this is the world's wealthiest person, so it's pretty significant what he, what he thinks politically. Yeah, Elon Musk is, he's not just a very strong kind of libertarian figure who's become the hero figure of a lot of people on the far right. 
think he's also someone a bit more dangerous than that because he's he's given a lot of um he's he's used a lot of dog whistles of the far right he knows exactly how to flirt with these audiences um whilst not being too explicit about it i think he's actually a very smart person but who is who is hugely dangerous in how he is also now opening the doors again to again also reversing all the progress that we've made in the past few years trying to get the big platforms to remove harmful content and uh, targeted hate and now a lot of these accounts are coming back have have come back to twitter and we see again anti-semitism rise we see racism rise anti-lgbtq uh, resentment it's really it's quite saddening honestly to see that and what do you make of the free speech argument though so he would say um you know uh, if something's illegal, that's for the state to... He, he has, in his defence, uh, I, I won't say that phrase very often with Elon Musk, he would say, where Twitter exists, we will abide by th that particular nation's laws. So if you have, you know, um, speech laws, then they can be enforced in Britain or Germany or wherever. Yeah. That seems like a reasonable thing to do, doesn't it? If I'm being devil's advocate here. Which he doesn't do, though. They don't do that because they usually stick to the US rules. So you can see that the, the regulations in, in, the US, uh, in the US are a lot more lenient than in Europe when it comes to hate speech. With both the EU regulations, but also on a country level, Germany has very strict mm. laws where it's, for example, it's forbidden to belittle the Holocaust or um, to share anything related to the Holocaust. And we're now seeing that uh, the, U uh, the, the Twitter under Elon Musk does only apply the standards and the rules based on US legislation. And of course, this free speech argument is a fair one, but I would say that free speech also does end whenever you, you, you limit the free speech of someone else. So I mm -hmm. think as soon as your own free speech <laughs> limits someone else's or silences someone else's free speech, that, is, that should not be um, legitimate anymore. But take, take COVID. If somebody if somebody makes a video and they say the vaccine isn't a vaccine, it's a therapeutic, and that's an inter that is an interesting debate, right? Because actually the levels of resistance it gave it's a, it's a it's a semantic debate, frankly. And therapeutics are very good. Good, let's call it therapeutic. Fine, but you know if somebody says actually the media is lying to you about how effective the COVID vaccine is, they should be able to say that, shouldn't they? Because to an ex a to an extent it was partly true initially. And I, I think, B, if you then stop people from saying that and it turns out to be true, then that in itself contributes to declining trust in the media, doesn't it? Whereas at least Twitter allows that. You, it's almost like a pressure valve for the debate. Yeah. I don't think that um, factually incorrect um, or, or even or, or opinion should be removed. I think as soon as these opinions are becoming dehumanizing or are really systematically cause in, um inciting hatred towards minority communities or towards an, an outgroup or towards individuals, I think that's when they are dangerous and when they should be removed. I think um, contents that might be arguably uh, perhaps biased or, or a personal opinion or factually incorrect, even the most, even some of the really the clearly incorrect pieces of content, I don't think that they should be removed really. Uh, I think that would be getting too close to censorship. Mm. But systematic, systematically coordinated disinformation campaigns should be removed, I think, because there it's more about the toxic behavior and the, for example, trolling armies or bot armies spreading, uh, systematically trying to manipulate public opinion by spreading false information. That is something that, again, I would say that should be tackled and not just moderated, mm. but probably removed. Mm. It's such an ambiguous line, isn't it? Because you know, I've I've said, for instance, my view is that we should we should send weapons to a, a Ukraine to defend itself. It has a right as a sovereign country to defend itself. But then, when when somebody says Ukraine shouldn't be able to join NATO, I think that should be a permissible um, statement or position because it, if you disagree with it, it needs to be refuted, and you need to explain why it's refuted. And I, you know, I was listening to Kaya Kallas, the um, the Estonian PM. And she had to explain why she thinks it's a good idea for Ukraine to be in NATO. And I thought she's made a really compelling argument there. But the point is you need to make the argument and you need to say why somebody's wrong. And my worry is with this stuff is that somebody, for instance, says that, oh, no, Ukraine shouldn't be let in NATO, which I think is a legitimate thing to say. You can say that because there may be, if people are wrong about this, there may be horrific downsides, horrific downsides, even if not probable, possible. On the other hand, somebody could say, Putin apologist. Putin sympathizer, even though the person might, you know, they might have, for all we know, 
There might be a, a political refugee from Russia, for all we know. So, so where do you stand on something like that, where, where something is just an individual's opinion or they can perhaps be enmeshed within a broader thing? So you're saying, oh, well, you're saying Putin talking points, ergo, you shouldn't have a platform. What happens to somebody like that? Yeah, I think it's a slippery slope because, of course, um, there is a lot of generalization happening that puts people into immediately into categories. I think that's something extremely dangerous because it can actually lead to uh, to people really using to actually it can lead to that being a starting point for radicalization because if someone gets humiliated or or um, yeah publicly, I think that is um, and especially being called. For example, also the same was true. I was trying to be really nuanced also for that reason with um, vaccine skepticism and with uh, with COVID deniers, for example, or people who really thought the whole pandemic was a plot, um, was a pandemic. I think there is a massive difference between the two and putting all of them in the same category risks that actually, yeah, then maybe some people would turn away from um, from the people who label them like that or who put labels mm. on, on them as a whole category. Uh, this has been really illuminating. We could have talked about that last bit for an hour in itself. Thank you so much for joining us on Downstream. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure.